So today we've been in wonderful air studios in the, in the hall recording brilliant British musicians. One of the key things we were saying is that we wanted to sort of like bring the stench of him into a room, you know, because he poisons everything. You know, there's something toxic about him, no matter how charming and, uh, and amusing he can be, he's also a beast. We'd spend the first few weeks creating a palette of sounds and ideas and themes and, and textures that start to generate a sound world that all the music's going to live in. Discovering and creating a world which Dracula could bring with him because we were sort of quite keen for not only the music to be sort of descriptive of him but actually the sound of the music. So all the new sounds are organic so at its core all these sounds are somewhat disturbing because their DNA is real. Wine glasses with blood in, rub, making percussion things out of coffins. I mean it's quite macabre but also good fun. It's always a joy to come somewhere where the sets and the, the thinking uh, that's gone into production design is at this level. I've probably never worked on sets as amazing as these, never. You feel like you are in a castle in 1895. Part of the original pitch was, it's going to be the scariest castle you ever saw. It's fantastically impressive. I, I love a great set, and Castle Dracula was just absolutely magnificent. There was bits in the script that I had to adhere to, but for me, the, I wanted this grand kind of sweeping entrance. The costume for Dracula, obviously, you know, is the infamous cape. That cape is an immense piece of cloth on your back. We constructed um, a back so that he could use it as a back wing, as almost like a bat. We did the interior here. Very impressive set with this huge staircase. So of course the cape looked amazing. And with the red lining signifying the blood feel, it worked really well. So Jonathan Harker had come from England, traveling overseas. So he'd be in a traveling outfit. So it's very British, very tweedy. The colors were good, nice contrast against the darkness of Dracula. As the story continues, Jonathan gets more and more dishevelled and broken down, and the costume reflects that. They're making me appear emaciated through the use of the clothes I'm wearing. As he was kind of becoming more frail and finding different routes around the castle, we also made the castle a little bit more decayed as well, so that the both of them kind of travel through the story at the same time. And the devil really is in the detail in this job. Oh, it was a, a very sad day when we had to tear it down. In fact, we left it up for a bit longer than it was due to stay up just because people couldn't bear to say goodbye to it. The big challenge in episode one, in terms of the prosthetics and the makeup, was Dracula, of course, starts as he does in the novel, as an extremely old man, as he feeds off Jonathan Harker, turns into the more traditional image of the younger, suave, darker Dracula. We knew that for him, Dracula was going to be quite a difficult thing for him to get through, you know, because he's got makeup, teeth, lenses, lenses. wigs, a lot. One of the key challenges was the sequence at the convent gates. We read in the script that, the, that Dracula uh, is born out of a wolf. You read it on the page and you think, my God, this is so, how is that going to be possible? We sculpted the wolf that we could put on the floor, that could still be moving around, still be puppeteered, that we could rip open and then from a cavity under the floor, we would push actors through. This controls the jaw and uh, You've got the head, you're yep. doing the head movements and can move it from left to right, up and down and side to side. These rods here control the legs of the, of the wolf, just sort of twitchy little movements and things. It's not the most pleasant thing I've done. Blood all over. I don't know about you girls, but I do love a bit of fur.